Hello, welcome to my video on government intervention in markets. For anyone who's been watching the whole series, this is the last one. Woohoo! It's part of the markets and market failure section of economics AS level with AQA. There are lots of reasons for government intervention in a market. One major one is to correct market failure. In the previous video, we looked at all the different types and causes of market failure, and now we're going to look at how to correct them. Another reason for intervention is to achieve more equity. For example, it's not very fair if some people have got millions and some people are living on streets of absolutely nothing. So the government does lots of things to try to improve the balance within the economy. The final reason for intervention is to improve the UK's economic performance. Obviously, this is more macroeconomic than microeconomic, but it's still good to know that this is a reason for intervention. There are lots of different forms of government intervention. One major one is legalisation and regulation. So this protects a variety of things. For example, it protects workers by giving them maximum working hours, minimum wage. I think there's a certain limit on the amount of time you can work in a year. You've got to have a certain amount of holiday. And this is to prevent the abuse of workers and stuff like that. And we've also got trade unions which help this further. Though obviously when trade unions get too strong, this could in essence become a form of market failure itself because the workers are getting paid too much for their job. Increasing competition is another thing that comes under legalisation and regulation. So this is the prevention of monopolies through things like the Competition Commission. We don't want monopolies for the reason explained in the previous video because when we have monopolies prices are too high, quality is too low, not enough choice for consumers, stuff like that. We also have government regulators who impose price controls, we're going to come on to that later in the video, but that's things like maximum and minimum prices. Obviously in a free market we have underproduction of merit goods and public goods just don't tend to be produced at all, total market failure there. This means that the government has to provide some of these goods and services or has to pay private sector firms to do these jobs. Moving on now to financial intervention, we're going to look at a few diagrams for these later, but the big ones are indirect taxes, which raise the price of demerit goods. So if we don't want people smoking, we put a big indirect tax on it, and it means the supply has to fall and the price has to rise. And we'll do all about the taxation and the splitting of who pays what later. Subsidies are basically the opposite, so that lowers the price of merit goods. And then we have tax relief, which enables research and development, so companies can get more efficient methods of production, stuff like that. We can try to achieve economic and productive efficiency. And then we have taxation and welfare payments to redistribute income to increase the equity within the economy. These taxes tend to be progressive, we'll come on to this later, because it means that the rich have to pay a higher percentage of their income, so this means that we can give more to the poor people. And finally, we have intervention to close the information gap. So the government tries to improve the information so the consumers have got all the information before they buy. Good producers really can see the true cost and benefit of the goods. This is obviously really important when we've got positive or negative externalities which lead to goods being priced incorrectly in terms of the socially efficient output. There are lots of effects of intervention. We're going to have a slide about each of these in a second. It's just a list so you can see them here. I believe there are six effects of intervention. Public goods, externalities, correcting information failure, price intervention, regulation and control of monopolies, and the redistribution of income. Public goods are non-excludable and non-rival, which means that they don't tend to be produced in the private sector because they're unprofitable to supply. This means that the free market totally fails to provide important public goods, which is complete market failure. This means that the government has to provide them, and to provide them the government needs to have the money to do so, it means it has to tax the people in the economy. Because obviously the government requires funding to be able to supply these public goods. So in terms of correcting market failure, the government has to supply public goods. Externalities are obviously a really big issue in terms of market failure and stuff like that, with positive and negative externalities meaning that the market mechanism output is either far higher or far lower than the socially efficient output. We have lots of different ways of trying to correct this. One of these is regulation. Regulation is rules to the firms which make sure that they try to keep their negative externalities to a low. So, for example, there might be regulation saying you can only pollute up to a certain amount, you can only use trees which were dying anyway. I don't know what sort of regulation you might have, but stuff like that, try to reduce negative externalities. Pollution permits are the big things nowadays. These are permits which allow firms to pollute up to a limit, and these permits can be traded between firms, countries, whatever. So say I had a permit which allowed me to emit 100 of pollution, I don't know what measurement you'd use, 
and I only used 50, I could sell the other 50 to another company which is polluting more. So it's really beneficial for me and other firms to keep our pollution to a low, whereas firms that have higher pollution have higher costs and may end up getting kicked out of the market. So this is an incentive for firms to stay clean. Taxes are generally put on the firm rather than the consumer, but the amount that's paid by the firm and the consumer differs depending on whether it's an elastic good or an inelastic good. The one that I've put here is for an inelastic good, for example, cigarettes. Because the good is inelastic, oh, just got a text. Because the good is inelastic, it means that the consumers will still be willing to pay for the good no matter how high the price gets. Therefore, the firm that's producing it thinks, aha, I may as well pass most of the tax on to the consumers. In the diagram there, you can see the split of who pays what tax. And it's always the one at the top is always consumers, and the one at the bottom is always producers. A good way to remember this is alphabetical order going downwards, CP. That's how I remember it. Obviously, with elastic goods, it's a totally different story, and the producers end up paying the bulk of the tax. The value of the tax in this diagram is the vertical distance between the two supply lines. And we can see that the impact this has had is raising the cost of production, which has therefore caused supply to shift left and demand to have a contraction, meaning that the quantity supplied obviously goes left, it decreases, and obviously the price rises. Subsidies essentially have the opposite effect. Quite often a government would give a subsidy to a firm and say this subsidy is for you to keep clean. So it might not necessarily reduce the cost of production, it might just cover the cost of production, the increased cost of keeping your firm clean. They could ask you to define taxes or subsidies. In 2013, subsidy was the definition that you had to do in the microeconomic paper. Moving on now to correcting information failure. The government tries to protect consumers from being sold faulty products, so we have trading standards, stuff like that. I spoke to trading standards once because my young enterprise team was selling some candles. We weren't 100% sure if they were safe, so we went to trading standards to make sure we were supplying the consumers with products that were good, safe, happy. They weren't really happy, but they were safe. We also have compulsory labelling, which informs consumers on the actual costs of the consumption. So when we have our food, you can look at the food and see how much calories is in it, what fat's in it, stuff like that. So the consumers are totally aware of the true cost of what they're eating. Obviously, you're never going to have absolutely perfect information. I mean, you can get close to perfect information, like with uh, computers, when you're buying computers, I might just go into shop and buy a computer, but you get some people that are there, they've compared all the different things, the hard drive space, stuff like that, I've got no idea what they even compare, but they can get a really accurate view that what they're getting is the right thing for them. So the government tries to make sure that all of this information is out there and is accessible to the consumer. Then we have price intervention, such as the maximum prices, minimum prices and buffer stocks. Maximum prices are there to prevent rise, markets rising above a certain level, so the price is kept at a certain amount. This does lead to excess demand, because more is demanded than is supplied, because the demand and supply are unable to meet at the equilibrium, market like mechanism equilibrium. However, this does increase equity within the market, because it means that everybody is able to buy a certain good or service. For example, with tickets to watch whoever you want to go watch in concert, if they were higher, it would mean that less people could afford the tickets, but when these tickets are priced at a lower amount, it means that more people are able to buy the tickets. Obviously, this means we have to have a system of distribution of tickets, how are we going to decide who gets the tickets? Usually, you do first come, first served, and this could have an unexpected impact of forming a black market. Then we have minimum prices. A big one for this is food. It means that the farmers that are producing the food are able to do this at an economically viable level because otherwise the price of food would be much too low and it would be unsubstantial for them to be able to do it so we wouldn't get any food and we'd all starve to death. Another big one for minimum prices is minimum wage. It means that workers have a minimum wage. It means that they don't get abused. They, they're getting a certain amount because in some countries where there isn't a minimum wage, workers will work hard for hours and hours and hours and all they get is like 1p, which is enough to buy like a no, I don't know what you can get for 1p in those countries. But it's not enough for them to have a what you generally could be considered an acceptable standard of living. So we have our minimum prices and minimum wages. Buffer stocks are an intervention system that aims to limit the fluctuations of the price of a commodity, for example grain and wheat and stuff like that. If you look on the diagram there, the authorities want to maintain the price of P1 and they need to ensure that supply is at Q1 for the price to be at this level. One year due to good weather or something, supply might be at Q3. This means that the authorities will buy Q3 to Q1 of supply so that the supply released to the market is Q1 and the price is retained at that level. Maybe the next year there's drought, bad weather, so the supply that 
the farmers get is only Q2, so the authorities have got their supply they bought last year and they sell it. They sell Q2 to Q1 of supply, so the supply released the market as Q1, so it retains, remains even at Q P1. Obviously there are some issues with buffer stocks, the big ones are how do we finance them? I mean, if we're buying this much quantity of stuff, it's going to be really expensive, so we have to increase taxation, obviously people get mardy about that, stuff like that. Then we have the difficulties involved in establishing a target price, how do we decide what P1 we want, what's fair for everybody. And finally there are massive storage costs, if we're storing this much grain, this much wheat, that is expensive. And also grain and wheat, it's perishable, it might just die in the year that we bought it, which means that when supply is lower than what we want, we can't sell this stuff because it's all out of date, it's gone. So that is a major issue, especially with agricultural foods, which is a main thing for buff stock. Moving on now to monopolies, which are bad because they have higher prices, poorer quality, we have our fat cats, there's fewer firms, so less employment, they can be less efficient because they've got no incentive to be more efficient and save money. They create barriers to entry, which means other firms can't get in. And they tend to be less innovation and can lead to an actually a failing market, which obviously we don't want. Luckily for us, we have a great government, which has loads of stuff to prevent this from happening. These monopolies trying to keep their monopoly power to a minimum. Remember, monopoly power is when firms have 25% or more share of the market. So we have the Competition Commission, which is a government-controlled scheme organisation which ensures that mergers are in the public interest. It means that mergers and takeovers, which could lead to a monopoly, it prevents them from happening. Then we have some natural monopolies, which are in the government ownership. Natural monopolies is when it makes economic sense for there to be just one monopoly, for example, supplying gas, water, electricity, that sort of thing. It makes more sense for there to be just one firm doing it than lots of different firms, lots of different pipes, stuff like that. Then we have privatisation. The government may have these natural monopolies, but it might want to pass it out because it's more effective and cheaper for there to be a firm that's private than a government-controlled firm because private firms tend to have better organisation, better management, more incentive to be efficient, stuff like that. For example, we had Royal Mail. Did Royal Mail go private? I think it did. It might not have done, so don't 100% trust me there. But stuff like that, I think we've privatised Royal Mail for that reason. There was quite a lot of controversy around the Royal Mail privatisation, but I mean, we have our business secretary, Vince Cable, he said it went quite well, but then the shadow business secretary said it was a first class disaster. What a joker. <laughs> and finally, we have the removal of barriers to entry, which encourages new firms to enter the market, because obviously more competition means more variety of goods and services, tend to be lower price, more efficiency, that sort of thing. Barriers to entry, removing them, we could give firms sort of loans at uh, low interest rate for startup costs because obviously high startup costs means it's very hard for new firms to come into a market. We might prevent monopolies from putting their prices to down to a certain level because when monopolies see that a new firms coming into the market they tend to put their prices right down which means the new firms simply can't compete. With the redistribution of income, the government tends to use progressive taxation which is essentially the Robin Hood effect. It takes money from the rich and gives it to the poor. The big thing that everyone thinks of when they think of progressive taxation is income tax. Obviously higher earners pay 40%, 45%, whatever they pay, whereas poor earners, they don't pay any tax, or if they pay some tax, it's not very much. The government takes this money and it tends to use it to provide welfare benefits. Obviously welfare benefits mean that poorer people who don't get so much income or they're unemployed, they get money towards having financial security so they can afford food, and clothing and stuff like that. We also have our child benefits and other different benefits that we have for like ill people, stuff like that, is to make sure there's equity within the economy because obviously lack of equity is one major form of market failure. However, we have a tragedy of our time, government failure. There's two slides of lots of different types of government failure. There are eight total causes of government failure and we're gonna go through them now. Political self-interest is one biggie. It's because people who are in power think, aha, there's an election coming up, I'm going to do stuff that's good for the people, not necessarily good for the economy, but good for the people, they're going to vote for me and we'll get back in. Then we have our special interest groups who spend and tax inappropriately, for example, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the Green Party, but if the Green Party got into power, they might do massive taxation on people that simply can't afford it, just to spend it on getting more wind turbines. So obviously that might not have the best effect for the economy, so the government might have failed in its attempt to give the economy the best chance at floating being successful. And then we have policy myopia. 
what a snazzy name that has. This is when polit politicians look for short-term solutions to the problems. So, for example, if there is an election coming up pretty quickly, you might think, I know, I'm going to do something really short-term, it's going to be really fast, quick, everyone's going to think, woohoo, it looks good, and then suddenly, after the election, everyone's going to realise, oh my god, that's only a short-term solution, we've got obviously a long-term issue. The thing I'm thinking of at the top of my head for this is Gordon Brown, when he sold all that gold, obviously it gave us money really quickly, but then the price of gold suddenly rose dramatically, and we realised we made a massive loss there. Another example here is subsidies. Obviously, in the short term, subsidies are great. They mean firms can enter the market, produce more efficiently, but they distort markets really badly. They lead to inefficiency because firms think, ah, I've got my subsidy, don't need to do that much, stuff like that. And then we have regulatory capture, which is when industries that are under the control of regulatory bodies favour producers rather than consumers. I'm thinking here of Nazi Germany. I think it was when Hitler got into power, he was quite good friends with all the big business leaders. So he did stuff that was really good for them, but it meant the consumers had to pay much higher prices. They obviously couldn't afford it. Really wasn't very good. This is government failure because it means that the consumers lose out. Then we have the disincentive effect. The big one that everyone thinks of here is benefits. People see, oh look, there's benefits. Why should I work? I may as well get benefits. So this disincentivizes people from working, so it leads to more unemployment. Because people think, I can earn just as much if I'm on benefits as if I'm working. So they collect their benefits. This leads to productive inefficiency within the economy because less is, not all of the factors of production are really being used to their full maximum output. So we're not on the production possibility boundary. Moving on to the second load of government failures, one is when the policy decisions are based on imperfect information. For example, less and less people are voting every year. The people that are voting tend to be the older people who are going to die soon. So the government obviously has to follow the older people's ideas, which means that the policies it implements aren't necessarily the ones that are going to be best for the society of tomorrow. This is why it's really important for everybody to vote, because the government doesn't know what the public wants. People who vote don't necessarily understand the policies. It means it's government failure because the wrong thing is happening for the economy. It's not necessarily what would be best for the economy and the future generation. Next, we have the law of unintended consequences, which is when the actions of consumers, producers and the government actually has an unanticipated effect. Obviously, we've already done the benefits you know, we think, oh, it's going to have equity, but actually it leads to more unemployment. Another one is a tax on a demerit good. For example, cigarettes, we put a big tax on it. We think, oh, yay, less people are going to smoke. It actually leads to tax evasion, smuggling, black markets, stuff like that. The costs of actually implementing a policy could be a major issue because obviously government intervention is quite expensive to administer and enforce. We might say no one can smoke in buildings. But people might still smoke in buildings and it would be far too expensive for the government to actually be able to monitor whether people are smoking in buildings. So the cost of making sure people don't might be more expensive than the social cost, I suppose, of people not smoking in buildings. Finally, we have conflicting objectives. This is obviously much more prominent in the macroeconomic section and we don't really want to dip into that here because it leads to a trade-off of policies. I'll try to avoid this one mainly because... It is verging on macroeconomics more, I'd say. For example, with the fiscal policy, if we have lots of policies to increase employment, but then we've also got policies in place to decrease inflation, these are going to be a major conflict because they basically cancel each other out, which means it's just rubbish, really. You won't tend to get a question actually about government failure itself, you'll be more likely to get a question that says evaluate costs and benefits of government doing this what are different ways that the government could do this and then you'd do it so you'd write the government could put a tax and then after that you'd put however this tax could have this effect this unexpected effect stuff like that make sure you slip it in because you need both sides of the argument when you're writing an essay that is the end of the microeconomic videos woohoo AS level microeconomics is all the videos have been made, if you want to watch them, go back over them, then just do that. I've got a set of notes that have slightly more detail than in these videos if you want them, so just comment below. Hope these videos have helped you in some way, and good luck in your exams. Have a lovely day. Bye.